All right, Romans 14, verse 13 to 23. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is, not, is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. For whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Amen. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for this time of worship. And God, um, man, this year has been tough. Uh, the past week and, and, and the month, Lord, we've been getting uh, more reasons to cry out, Lord. Um, more people are suffering and losing their lives. And God, this year has just been such a dark time for all of us. Uh, but Lord, in the midst of that, we thank you that you continue to speak to us. You continue to remind us of the hope we have in you. Uh, Lord, we thank you that we can continue to worship you as well and have a relationship and communion with you. And we thank you for uh, this time uh, where you can speak to us, Lord, that your word refreshes us and reminds us of what's truly important and uh, how we ought to have joy in you in whatever season we're in. So God, help us to humble ourselves to you today and to hear your voice clearly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've ever spoken to a non-Christian about Christianity or just religion as a whole, one of the questions you might get is, if there is one God, why are there so many religions? Right? If there's one God and He's revealing Himself, how can we all interpret uh, this one religion in so many different ways. Um, and they might try to use that as a, a reason for why religions are not actually divine, but they're just made up by humankind. If you get even more specific and you're talking about uh, Jesus being God, um, there is often this criticism that says, if Jesus is, is God, then why are there so many variations or versions of Christianity? For example, you have the Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox Church, you have Mormons and Jehovah's Witness that also claim to follow Jesus. You have all the Protestant denominations, Presbyterian, Baptist, Pentecostal, and, and the list goes on and on. But uh, what someone who's not a Christian might not understand is that not all of these distinctions carry the same weight. Okay? Um, not all truth is uh, truth is created equal, but not all ideas are created equal. And the disagreements between different variations of religions is one thing, but even more so, when we talk about variations between, for example, Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, Catholics, these things, there's specific issues why these divisions exist. And they exist because there are some essential truths that cannot be compromised on. For example, I would never be allowed to speak in a Catholic church or a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness gathering. Likewise, a Catholic priest or a Mormon leader or a Jehovah's Witness would never be allowed to speak at our church. Why? Because we have essential beliefs that are contrary to one another. For example, Mormons and Jehovah's Witness deny that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. They just consider him some kind of lesser deity or some kind of lesser angelic being. That's a problem for us. That's, a, that's an essential truth that we can't compromise on. Um, also, Catholics and Eastern Orthodox, they have a different understanding of how someone is saved, how someone is forgiven and considered righteous by God. 
Um, we as Protestants, we believe that you're saved by faith alone in Christ alone. But for Catholics and Eastern Orthodox, there's other things that are in that mix. And I'm not um, getting into this just to talk about differences and talk about divisions, but I do want to talk about why these differences exist. And the overarching, the, just the general answer is that there are things that are worth fighting over and there are things that are not worth fighting over. For example, the differences between Presbyterian and Baptist don't have so much to do with essential doctrines or essential truths. We commonly affirm the same essential things, but it's some of the non-essential things that we don't agree on, which is why we can still maybe go on mission trips together or do service work together, but we won't necessarily have fellowship every week together. So I want to answer two questions today. What is and isn't worth fighting over as Christians? And that's the context of our passage today. This isn't just talking about disputes that Christians might have with the world. That's not what's in view of today's passage. This is talking about Christians having disagreements and having issues with one another. And Paul is talking about what is worth fighting over and what isn't worth fighting over. Let me answer the first question first. What is worth fighting for? Um, it's not limited to, but it is going to be centralized on the gospel of Jesus according to the scriptures. This is worth fighting for. This is the hill that we as Christians must be willing to stand and die on. The, the gospel of Jesus, the good news that Jesus Christ is God and man who lived the perfect life died for our sins so that we could be forgiven and accepted as children of God and that we will reign with him forever when he returns in power to judge the living and the dead. That is worth fighting for. That message, we cannot compromise that message because it is the main point of the whole scriptures. Now, what is not worth fighting for? And let me just start off by saying, this is a much longer list, okay? What is not worth fighting for? There's so many things that are not worth fighting over amongst Christians. But to answer the question in a general sense, I will say that what, the things that are not worth fighting over as brothers and sisters in Christ are those things that are open to interpretation and matters of personal opinion and conviction. Okay, there are certain things in the scriptures that are not open to interpretation. I just mentioned the main one, the gospel of Jesus. That one's not open to interpretation. We as Christians, we are not willing to accept someone saying that Jesus is not God. We as Christians, we are not willing to accept someone saying that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Those are things that we ought to fight over as Christians. In fact, if you were to say those things, we would consider you not a Christian because those are essential to the Christian identity and what Christ has preached in the scriptures. However, there are so many other things that the Bible doesn't talk about specifically and the Bible doesn't tell us to stand firmly on a lot of different things. And these things are open to interpretation. And these things have more to do with personal conviction and our opinions, our own reasoning with the Holy Spirit, and our consciences to try to make the best decisions. And what Paul is saying here is that there are these essential things that we ought to be making sure we have absolute unity on. And there's other things that can break our unity, but they're not important enough for us to break our unity. Therefore, we should let love cover over those things and be understanding of one another and be mutual, uh, mutually upbuilding each other. So the central idea in today's text is this. Loving your brothers and sisters in Christ is more important than your rights as a Christian. Okay, Loving your brothers and sisters in Christ is more important than your rights as a Christian. When I talk about Christian rights, they're often called Christian freedoms or Christian liberties. And basically, these are talking about all the things that Christians are free to do being justified in the righteousness of Christ. So in the context of the, of the scriptures, both the Jewish Christians and the non-Jewish Christians both come from prior religious backgrounds, right? Jew, Jewish Christians came from Judaism. 
In Judaism, there's very strict laws and rituals and ceremonial uh, commands that they need to keep. For example, they're not allowed to eat certain kinds of foods. And there's certain rituals that they need to do in order to worship God properly. Well, as a Christian, even in the, in the first century times of Jesus, Christ said we are free from those things. We're not bound and limited to rituals the same way anymore. And likewise, from the Greco-Roman world where there were non-Jewish Christians, they all came from systems of idol worship, right? And idol worship similarly also had sacrificial systems. And there were also certain rituals, some uh, containing uh, sexual actions as well as be getting drunk and doing things together. Like there were a lot of different kinds of pagan rituals that people came out of and in Christ, we are free from all those rituals because there's only one thing that really matters when it comes to our righteousness, our forgiveness, and our uh, reconciliation with God, and that is our faith in Jesus Christ. So in that faith in Jesus Christ, we have all these Christian freedoms. We cannot be condemned by the things that the world or other religions might consider ourselves condemned. Why? Because we have liberty in Christ. But as much as those things are important, Paul is making the point here in this passage that loving your brother and sister is always, should always take priority over those Christian liberties when they are non-essential things. Okay, they, We are not bound by dietary laws. We, Christians, we are free to eat anything. We are free to eat meat. We are free to eat vegetables. We are free to do all these things. But Paul is making a point here, and he makes this point in other epistles as well, that if it is causing your brother grief or causing them to stumble in their faith, that that is a bad thing. And you should instead choose to love them over your own personal rights. The sermon in a sentence for us today is that you must love through differing opinions while standing united in the gospel. Okay, Love through differing opinions you may have with fellow Christians, brothers and sisters. It's possible and it exists. We have to accept it. We have to love through those things while standing united in the gospel. Okay, When we're looking at the book of Romans, um, we're in the last section of Romans. Chapter 16 is the last one. And in this last section between chapter 12 and 16, Paul is focusing on talking about unity in Christ. How the church of God should have unity in Christ as they live together in uh, growing sanctification of the Holy Spirit. But in, in the first three sections of Romans, chapter 1 through 4, and then chapter 5 through 8, and chapter 9 through 11, Paul is doing a detailed breakdown of the gospel. So he's making it really clear, these are the essential truths that we must all affirm. And then starting at chapter 12, he says, okay, given these essential truths of the gospel, who Jesus is, who we are in him, the righteousness of God, the sinfulness of man, and the promises that are fulfilled in Christ, chapter 12 through 16, is this is now then how we should live in response to the identity we have in Christ. I remember when I was, uh, I, I'm not sure, I think I was in college or just about to head into grad school, one of the greatest uh, sayings or advice that was given to me uh, you've probably heard it before, is to major in the minors and my, uh, major in the majors, sorry, and minor in the minors. Okay, what that means is major, focus your time and energy, invest in the things that are majorly important. Okay, and the things that are minor, things that are trivial, things that are secondary, tertiary, those are things that you shouldn't waste too much of your time and energy on because if you do it too much, that's when it becomes a waste. And this is just a general principle for life, and I think it definitely applies to uh, our lives and what the Scripture teaches. There are clearly things in the church that are totally worth fighting over. In fact, the New Testament specifically um, mentions issues that are worth breaking unity even with, with uh, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. In fact, these would be issues where you would have to break unity and consider them no longer brothers and sisters in Christ. 
Some of these, uh, in 1 Corinthians 5, 11 to 13, it talks about when you have a brother who calls himself a Christian, but is living in a pattern of sexual immorality, or living in a pattern of greed, idolatry, uh, drunkenness, or being a swindler. It says, do not even associate with one of them. He says, purge the evil person from among you. So when Paul talks about us not judging one another, he's not saying that we shouldn't keep each other accountable as Christians. In fact, in, in that passage, 1 Corinthians 5, 12, he says, what have I to do with judging outsiders? He's saying, why, why are, is the church focused on judging non-Christians? That's not where our focus should be. Our focus as a church should be on judging inside the church. Why? Because we bear the name of Christ. And if we bear the name of Christ, our manner of life ought to reflect that, which is why continuous patterns of sin are not permissible. In Matthew 18, verse 15 to 17, Jesus himself breaks down the process in which we should reconcile when someone sins against us. When a brother, a fellow Christian, sins against you, go tell him his fault. If they don't repent, then take two or three with you. If they don't repent even then, tell the whole church. And when the whole church approaches them and they don't repent, that means they have an unrepentant heart and it says treat them as a Gentile or tax collector. That means treat them as if they're not a brother or sister in Christ. In Galatians 1, 8 to 9, this is going back to what I talked about in the, at the, as the gospel being the, the thing that we need to make sure to fight over and be willing to die for. Galatians 1, 8 to 9, Paul says, Even if an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. So there clearly are issues that we are taught through Jesus and the apostles in the scriptures that we ought to be fighting over and that we must be willing to even break ties over. But, as I mentioned before, that list is fairly small. And the other list, the things that, we, that, that aren't worthy of fighting over, is much longer. In verse 13, Paul says, Let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Once again, this is talking about non-essential things. And then he says in verse 14, I know I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love by what you eat. Do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. A big issue in the early church was, had to do with food that was sacrificed to idols. And keep in mind that outside of Jerusalem and, uh, and Judah, where these other churches were, were was a Roman world. And in the Roman world, most of the meat that was sold in the marketplaces were remains of meat that were sacrificed in temples for Roman gods. So it was fairly impossible to not participate in eating, consuming food that was not sacrificed to idols, even though you weren't present at the actual sacrificial ritual. So this became a problem amongst um, the Jews and the Gentile Christians when they were having fellowship together. And some considered it so, so much of a problem that they refrained from eating meat altogether. Others would refrain specifically from eating, eating meat sacrificed to idols, whereas some understood what Paul affirms here, that there's nothing wrong with the meat itself, right? Just because meat was sacrificed to idols, it doesn't mean that like there's demons inside the meat and that if you eat the meat, somehow you're going to be possessed or anything like that. Paul's saying there's nothing unclean of it in of itself. But what does he say? If someone else doesn't agree with you, maybe they're not there yet in their understanding. In, in, in fact, Paul calls this group those that are weaker in the faith meaning maybe they're more, less mature in their walk with the Lord. Maybe they're brand new Christians who are just really scared about doing anything that resembles things of their previous life. He says, don't destroy your brother over an issue like this. You know, I actually experienced something similar to this uh, in my own personal life. Uh, when I was a new Christian in college, I went to a mission trip uh, and uh, the missionary took us to this Buddhist temple. And it was to try to teach us about what people believe in, in that area and things like that. 
And we went to this Buddhist temple. Uh, we sat in on kind of the Buddhist lunch ritual. So these monks came out. They gave us these bowls of like vegetable soup. And they gave us these little booklets of like Buddhist chants to read as we were eating the food. And I was in a crisis moment because I was like, what is this? Why, why are we here? This feels so wrong, right? As a Christian, why are we participating in this Buddhist worship? And I looked over at the missionary, who was totally unfazed, by the way. He had already eaten up his whole bowl of food. And, and uh, that, you know, it wasn't just me there. There were other church members there that were confused. Some were eating, some weren't eating. And I just remember I was so crushed in that moment. And in my conscience, I was being destroyed. I felt as though we had all collectively sinned against the Lord by being there, that we had all somehow committed idolatry of varying degrees. And then later on that night, we had a, we had a meeting. And I remember I was just weeping and I was so upset because I, did, I wasn't told that we were going to do that. And it just seemed so wrong. Now, years later, you know, I look back at that and I understand why that, you know, could serve as a helpful learning experience. And I'm not bitter or angry anymore about it. And most importantly, I don't have any guilt about it. Um, I don't feel like I committed idolatry or anything like that. Um, and a lot of that has to do with because over the years I've been able to mature in my faith. And one of the things that I've learned is that, you know, even as a churchgoer, you could show up to the church building you could sing all the right songs and read the Bible, but if your heart's not really in it, that's not worship that pleases God. Likewise, if, if I'm present at you know, an, you know, a different worship gathering, if my heart's not in it, I'm not necessarily worshiping that idol either. And just because the food was given to me, it doesn't mean that by eating that food, I'm somehow affirming this idol worship or anything like that. And even though I understand all of that now, I would never have made that decision to, to do what that missionary did. And I don't mean this to condemn him, uh, but I would never make another Christian partake in something that could make them feel guilty, even though I know that they don't need to feel guilty about it. If they don't have a clear conscience about it, it wouldn't be loving of me to make them do or participate in anything like that. This is the kind of thing Paul's talking about. He's saying you might have the higher perspective on it. If you consider yourself strong in the faith, as, as, as you know, clearly that he, Paul's talking to two groups, those that are weak and those that are strong in this past. If you consider yourself as being strong, you shouldn't make those that are weak stumble. Don't destroy what God has started in their hearts. That's what Paul is saying here. Verse 14, if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Walking in love is the principle here that Paul is telling us. And the, the, the command to love God and to love others is, is not up to interpretation. That one is a clear command. And Christians, we ought to especially love uh, our brothers and sisters in love. So don't cause grief to your brothers just because you have a clear conscience about something. Because it might not mean that Everyone else around you does as well. They might be stumbled. They might see it as an obstacle in their faith. And rather than being criti critical of their faith and saying, well, you don't understand um, why this is okay, Paul gives a different alternative. Once again, these are all in regards to issues that are non-essential. They're not having to do with the gospel according to the scriptures. These are having to do with things that are up to interpretation, such as, food sacrificed to idols. And this is uh, verse 17 to 19. Paul kind of makes the main point here. He says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and in in joy in the Holy Spirit. He's saying, why shouldn't we make a big deal out of these things? Because they're not really that important when it comes to the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is what it's about. Paul is highlighting what is worth fighting for here, the kingdom of God. Not eating and drinking and all these other Christian liberties, but he says righteousness, the peace and joy we have in the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the righteousness, the justification we have in Christ through his perfect holy life. 
that we receive forgiveness of our sins, the peace that we have with God, and the peace that we can have with one another, having been reconciled, having been forgiven, and the joy that we have, which is the fruit of the Holy Spirit that lives in us when we are made as children of the Holy God. These are things that we ought to fight for because they have to do with the kingdom of God. But matters of eating and drinking, matters of vegetables and meat, He's saying these are not important. In verse 18, he says, whoever thus serves Christ, as long, he basically he's saying, as long as they're a Christian, as long as they're part of the kingdom of God, they're acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Up if we are all fellow servants of Christ, brothers and sisters, made righteous through the death and resurrection of Jesus by putting our faith in him as our Savior and King, we're living in peace with God and with man in the joy and the salvation we have in Christ. If these gospel truths are common among us, let us not fight over trivial things that make us have divisions among us. That's, that's essentially the point Christ, uh, Paul is making here. So how do you decide what is trivial and not? I'll, I'll give you two easy ways to discern that. How do you decide what's trivial or not in, when it comes to uh, differing opinions? Well, one, the first easy thing to do is ask yourself, does Jesus make a big deal about it? Does Jesus make a big deal about it? Because if, if Jesus is our king and he's our savior, he's our God, he's our example, then if he makes a big deal about something, we should make a big deal about something, right? Secondly, you should ask yourself, does Scripture make a big deal out of it? And you can't really answer the first one without answering the second one. You need to look to the Scriptures. What does the Bible say is the most important things? What does the Bible teach us that we ought to prioritize as we're discerning and interpreting through this life that we live? But most importantly, Paul is speaking to those that consider themselves strong or mature in the faith in the Roman church. And he says, Basically, if you're the strong one, if you are the strong one who's more mature in faith, then you should take the high road of love. If you're the strong one, why would you expect and demand those that are weaker than you in faith to get on your level, right? That doesn't make sense. If you're the strong one, you should be the one to take the high road of love and be willing to adjust to where they are at in their faith if they are indeed weaker than you, right? That's, that's what makes sense. And in today's church, food sacrifice to idols is not really an issue, right? Food sacrifice to idols is not an issue, although there are some dietary trends in our culture. You know, there's the, there's the veganism, which has to do with a kind of ethic about food. But none of those things are essential to our identity as Christians. And that's ultimately what Paul is saying here. He's saying, don't make these trivial issues have the consequence of whether or not someone is Christian or not. You don't get to judge people that way. Because whether or not someone is a child of God or not has only to do with their relationship to Jesus and the faith that they have in them. You can't bring in all these other things in addition to the gospel and try to make them essential when they are non-essential. I just want to give us a few examples of the things that we deal with today. I think um, some of it has to do with... Um, Smoking and drinking, for example. Um, smoking and drinking, you know, some, some churches say they're okay. Some churches say, no, absolutely not. You can't do it. What does the Bible teach on it? Well, the Bible says don't get drunk, but then the Bible clearly never says that drinking itself is bad, right? In fact, you know, the Lord's Supper had wine. So, you know, if drinking's bad, then, you know, Jesus sinned, when, you know, and that's, that's ridiculous, right? But in the issue of smoking and drinking, it's not an issue of whether or not it's on the sin list or the righteous list. It has more to do with interpretation, conviction, and loving your brother and sister. For example, if you have a member in your church who's a recovering alcoholic, you're not going to pass them a beer and say, hey, don't worry about it. It's not a sin. Like, go ahead and drink it. Right? That's not a loving thing to do for a brother or sister in Christ. Or if someone is, is, is under the age of 18 and, and you're not going to just smoke cigarettes in front of them and make them feel like it's totally okay. Why? Because it, it, it is harmful for them. You are free to do it as a Christian, but is that the loving thing to do for the children and younger people at your church? Probably not. 
right? So there's wisdom that we must exercise, and we must be careful not to condemn people because they're exercising their Christian liberty. But at the same time, we shouldn't condemn people for not understanding the Christian liberty totally. Why? Because we're all at different stages of our growth in not only our relationship with God, but our understanding of the Christian life. I think another one is church attire. It can be a big issue in certain cultural cu cultures and certain regions of the U.S. I mean, I probably might not be able to wear what I'm wearing now in certain churches uh, in the South. You know, maybe I'm underdressed. But in other churches, they, they emphasize that being most casual is, is the most intimate you can be with God, so everyone's encouraged to dress casually. Well, people have differing opinions on this, and guess what? The Bible doesn't tell us specifically that we're bound to these things. This is part of the Christian liberty thing. Whatever you're convicted, whatever you're felt to do in terms of honoring God, and that's really what it's about. It's about your heart. Are you doing these things because they're just your preferences, or are you doing them because you want to have a clear conscience with God? And if that's the case, then we can, we can just love each other through it. That's kind of the point that Paul's making. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul is dealing with um, what happened, the food sacrifice to idols. And once again, he makes the point, uh, we have this one in the slide. He makes the point that, yeah, there's nothing wrong with food sacrifice to idols. But what is his conclusion here? I'll read from verse 11. It says, And so by your knowledge, the weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience. When it is weak, you sin against Christ. So what Paul is saying here is that if you have weaker brothers in your church who are, you know, they're, they're troubled by you eating meat sacrificed to idols, he says doing it without having any care for them is, is wounding their conscience and that's not loving to them and thus a sin against Christ. In verse 13 he says, Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. So what is Paul's conclusion here? He's not saying, hey, all of you who think meat sacrifice to idol is bad, guess what? It's not bad. You better get with the program. That's not his, his resolution here. His resolution is that, look, if me eating meat causes you to stumble and that's where you're at in your faith, then as a brother, I'm willing to give up my Christian liberty in this issue and I won't eat meat around you. I won't, and he even goes stronger. He says, I will never eat meat because I care more about you and your conscience being clear with the Lord than about exercising my rights as a Christian. Right? So what is, what is the heart of the issue here? Paul is saying that, look, loving your brother is what's most, most important. As long as we have unity in the gospel, as long as we're all Christians, we can love through the areas that are open for interpretation. In verse 20, he says, Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. Likewise, it's wrong for anyone to make another person stumble over what kind of clothes they wear to church, right? Or what kind of music they listen to, or what kind of diet they're on, right? It's wrong to make each other stumble over these non-essential issues. In verse 21, he says, It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. That's, that's the point he's making. He's not saying keep your, your faith private and don't tell other people about Jesus. We know that's not what he's saying. But what he is saying is that if you have specific convictions about areas that are open for interpretation and are non-essential, that's great. You don't need to make everyone agree with you 100%. <laughs> He says, verse 23, uh, yeah, continuing verse 22, sorry. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So we get to the heart of the issue here, where Paul is saying, everyone needs to be acting out of faith, having a clear conscience with the Lord. If I, as a weaker Christian, for example, if I can't, you know, drink beer because I think that that's a sin, and I, you know, for whatever reasons, I, you know, then no one in my church should be trying to make me drink beer, right? No one should make me do that. Why? Because any action that doesn't proceed, that doesn't originate from my faith in Jesus, that is a sin. 
So what Paul is saying here is don't try to make other people eat food sacrificed to idols because if they do that, you're, you're making them go against their conscience. Don't make others go contrary to their convictions, contrary to their conscience, and make them feel guilt for something. Even if it's not really sin from an objective point of view, we don't need to do that to one another. We shouldn't do that to one another. And lastly, I just want to close on this point because I think it's relevant and timely uh, for us. This passage uh, speaks to something you know, that I think is important. And uh, as, as we all know, there's a big election coming up in November, and tensions are really high. If you thought tensions were high last time, you know, <laughs> it seems like they're even higher this time. And I'm surprised by how much my social media, especially my Facebook, is just flooded with, with so much content about these two political parties. And, and what shocks me is really what the Christians are saying. And what the Christians are saying are along the lines of, if you don't vote this way, then you're not really a Christian. Or if you don't vote this way, you're not really a Christian. Uh, this is an exact post from someone on my newsfeed, a Christian that I saw this morning. It says, so let me get this straight. You have a president that stands up for unborn and is defending religious liberty, and you as a Christian don't want to vote for him? What kind of nonsense is that? It's, it's this undertone that, that we have Christians have bought into that our political allegiances have some say on whether or not we're truly Christian or not, and that's false. Our identity in Christ is not dependent on who we vote for. This is an area of personal conviction and interpretation. And let's be honest, there's no one party that represents everything that the Bible represents. So there's always going to be issues to criticize the other side. But we as Christians, we shouldn't break unity over this. We shouldn't stop loving someone because they don't vote the same way as us. And we must keep in mind this very important principle about Jesus. Jesus came into the earth and to a location that had extremely high political tensions. He came to a people that were oppressed under Roman rule who were waiting for a Savior, a Messiah. And Jesus came. And if you didn't notice throughout his ministry, people wanted to rally around him because they thought he was going to be a military or political leader that would free the Israelites and the Jews from the grasp of the Roman Empire. However, is that what Jesus did? Did Jesus focus his ministry on politics? In fact, the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they constantly tried to throw questions at Jesus to trip him up so that he would get in trouble with the Roman authorities. But Jesus somewhat never invested in that conversation. In fact, what did he do? He proclaimed the kingdom of heaven instead of just trying to fix the problems with the kingdom on earth. And we need to learn from that as Christians. Remember I said, what did Jesus make a big deal of? What does scripture tell us to make a big deal of? It tells us to make a big deal of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, not so much what is happening in the kingdom of America. These things are important, and I'm not telling us to dismiss our civil responsibilities, but I think that we need to be careful and we need to check ourselves when we're starting to be willing to cut ties with fellow brothers and sisters simply because they have different political views than us. What is worth fighting for? The gospel of Jesus, the kingdom of God, according to the scriptures. What isn't worth fighting for? Many, many other things. And I just think I need to say that politics is not one of them. We shouldn't condemn a brother or sister in Christ because they don't share the same political views as us. No matter how strong our convictions are on that issue, it's not something that the Bible makes 100% clear, right? Because the issues are constantly changing. Parties are constantly changing. And candidates are constantly changing. There's no one party that is the Christian party. It never will be, as long as we're, we're not living in heaven. That's just the way it's going to be, right? So in these issues, we need to love through them. Loving our brothers and sisters in Christ is more important than just our personal convictions on these non-essential issues. They're more important than our Christian liberties. We need to love through differing opinions while standing united in the gospel of Christ. Let's fight and, and die on the hill of the gospel. And with everything else, let's be willing to love one another 
bear with each other's weaknesses. That is the way that Jesus said we will show the world that we're truly his disciples, by the way in which we love each other. So don't make others go contrary to their convictions. Don't threaten them with condemnation and make them question their identity in Christ over these non-essential issues because there's really one main issue. It's the kingdom of God and whether or not you're a part of the kingdom in Christ or you're not in the kingdom with Christ. That is the main task, the main issue for us as Christians. So let's not make all these non-essential things essential and let's really major in the major thing, which is Christ himself and the love of God shown to us through him, his death, his resurrection, and the forgiveness that we can all have and be a part of his kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. We thank you for your word, but we pray that we would learn from you, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to love the way we ought to love. Lord, we uh, can so easily uh, become tribalistic, uh, in our opinions and our convictions. And sometimes, Lord, we lack the discernment to realize what things are truly important and what things uh, can we can really relax on and, and, and actually love through. So God, help us to live out the scriptures that we see, uh, live out the scriptures that we read and were taught on today. And Lord, help us to truly exemplify a kind of love um, that is different than the world, Lord, that is greater than the world because it's not from us. And Lord, help us to also exemplify the kind of unity that is outside of this world too, a unity that is built upon the identity we have in Christ and his testimony. So we thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to 